The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter 2. The Little Shop Window. It still lacked half an hour of sunrise when Miss Hepzibah Pynchon, we will not say awoke, it being doubtful whether the poor lady had so much as closed her eyes during the brief night of midsummer, but, at all events, arose from her solitary pillow and began what it would be mockery to term the adornment of her person. Far from us be the indecorum of assisting even in imagination at a maiden lady's toilet. Our story must therefore await Miss Hepzibah at the threshold of her chamber, only presuming meanwhile to note some of the heavy sighs that labored from her bosom with little restraint as to their lugubrious depth and volume of sound inasmuch as they could be audible to nobody save a disembodied listener like ourself. The old maid was alone in the old house, alone except for a certain respectable and orderly young man, an artist in the daguerreotype line, who for about three months back had been a lodger in a remote gable, quite a house by itself indeed, with locks, bolts, and oaken bars on all the intervening doors. Inaudible, consequently, were poor Miss Hepzibah's gusty sighs. Inaudible, the creaking joints of her stiffened knees as she knelt down by the bedside, and inaudible too by mortal ear, but heard with all comprehending love and pity in the furthest heaven that almost agony of prayer now whispered, now a groan, now a struggling silence, wherewith she besought the divine assistance through the day. Evidently, this is to be a day of more than ordinary trial to Miss Hepzibah, who, for about a quarter of a century gone by, has dwelt in strict seclusion, taking no part in the business of life, and just as little in its intercourse and pleasures. Not with such fervor praised the torpid recluse, looking forward to the cold, sunless, stagnant calm of a day that is to be like innumerable yesterdays. The maiden lady's devotions are concluded. Will she now issue forth over the threshold of our story? Not yet by many moments. First, every drawer in the tall, old-fashioned bureau is to be opened with difficulty and with a succession of spasmodic jerks, then all must close again with the same fidgety reluctance. There is a ruffling of stiff silks, a tread of backward and forward footsteps to and fro across the chamber. We suspect Miss Hepzibah, moreover, of taking a step upward into a chair in order to give heedful regard to her appearance on all sides and at full length in the oval dingy framed toilet glass that hangs above her table. Truly, well, indeed, who would have thought it? Is all this precious time to be lavished on the matutinal repair and beautifying of an elderly person who never goes abroad, whom nobody ever visits, and from whom, when she shall have done her utmost, it were the best charity to turn one's eyes another way? Now she is almost ready. Let us pardon her one other pause, for it is given to the sole sentiment, or we might say better, heightened and rendered intense as it has been, by sorrow and seclusion, to the strong passion of her life. We heard the turning of a key in a small lock. She had opened a secret drawer of an escritoire, and is probably looking at a certain miniature done in Malbone's most perfect style, and representing a face worthy of no less delicate a pencil. It was once our good fortune to see this picture. It is a likeness of a young man in a silken dressing gown of an old fashion, the soft richness of which is well adapted to the countenance of reverie, with its full tender lips and beautiful eyes that seem to indicate not so much capacity of thought as gentle and voluptuous emotion. Of the possessor of such features, we shall have a right to ask nothing except that he would take the rude world easily and make himself happy in it. Can it have been an early lover of Miss Hepzibah? No. She never had a lover, poor thing, how could she? Nor ever knew by her own experience what love technically means. And yet, her undying faith and trust, her fresh remembrance, and continual devotedness towards the original of that miniature have been the only substance for her heart to feed upon. She seems to have put aside the miniature and is standing again before the toilet glass. There are tears to be wiped off, a few more footsteps to and fro, and here at last, with another pitiful sigh, like a gust of chill, damp wind out of a long, closed vault, the door of which has accidentally been set ajar, here comes Miss Hepzibah Pynchon. 
Forth she steps into the dusky time-darkened passage, a tall figure clad in black silk with a long and shrunken waist, feeling her way towards the stairs like a nearsighted person, as in truth she is. The sun, meanwhile, if not already above the horizon, was ascending nearer and nearer to its verge. A few clouds, floating high upward, caught some of the earliest light and threw down its golden gleam on the windows of all the houses in the street, not forgetting the house of the Seven Gables, which, many such sunrises as it had witnessed, looked cheerfully at the present one. The reflected radiance served to show pretty distinctly the aspect and arrangement of the room which Hepzibah entered after descending the stairs. It was a low, studded room with a beam across the ceiling, paneled with dark wood and having a large chimney piece set round with pictured tiles, but now closed by an iron fireboard through which ran the funnel of a modern stove. There was a carpet on the floor, originally of rich texture, but so worn and faded in these latter years that its once brilliant figure had quite vanished into one indistinguishable hue. In the way of furniture, there were two tables, one constructed with perplexing intricacy and exhibiting as many feet as a centipede, the other most delicately wrought with four long and slender legs, so apparently frail that it was almost incredible what a length of time the ancient tea table had stood upon them. Half a dozen chairs stood about the room, straight and stiff, and so ingeniously contrived for the discomfort of the human person that they were irksome even to sight, and conveyed the ugliest possible idea of the state of society to which they could have been adapted. One exception there was, however, in a very antique elbow chair with a high back, carved elaborately in oak, and a roomy depth within its arms that made up, by its spacious comprehensiveness, for the lack of any of those artistic curves which abound in a modern chair. As for ornamental articles of furniture, we recollect but two, if such they may be called. One was a map of the Pynchon territory at the eastward, not engraved, but the handiwork of some skillful old draftsman, and grotesquely illuminated with pictures of Indians and wild beasts, among which was seen a lion, the natural history of the region being as little known as its geography, which was put down most fantastically awry. The other adornment was the portrait of old Colonel Pynchon at two-thirds length, representing the stern features of a puritanic-looking personage in a skull cap with a laced band and a grisly beard, holding a Bible with one hand and in the other uplifting an iron sword hilt. The latter object, being more successfully depicted by the artist, stood out in far greater prominence than the sacred volume. Face to face with this picture on entering the apartment, Miss Hepzibah Pynchon came to a pause, regarding it with a singular scowl, a strange contortion of the brow, which, by people who did not know her, would probably have been interpreted as an expression of bitter anger and ill will. But it was no such thing. She, in fact, felt a reverence for the pictured visage of which only a far-descended and time-stricken virgin could be susceptible, and this forbidding scowl was the innocent result of nearsightedness and an effort so to concentrate her powers of vision as to substitute a firm outline of the object instead of a vague one. We must linger a moment on this unfortunate expression of poor Hepzibah's brow. Her scowl, as the world, or such part of it as sometimes caught a transitory glimpse of her at the window, wickedly persisted in calling it. Her scowl had done Miss Hepzibah a very ill office in establishing her character as an ill-tempered old maid. Nor does it appear improbable that, by often gazing at herself in a dim looking-glass and perpetually encountering her own frown within its ghostly sphere, she had been led to interpret the expression almost as unjustly as the world did. How miserably cross I look, she must often have whispered to herself, and ultimately have fancied herself so by a sense of inevitable doom. But her heart never frowned. It was naturally tender, sensitive, and full of little tremors and palpitations, all of which weaknesses it retained while her visage was growing so perversely stern and even fierce. Nor had Hepzibah ever any hardihood, except what came from the very warmest nook in her affections. All this time, however, we are loitering faint-heartedly on the threshold of our story. In very truth, we have an invincible reluctance to disclose what Miss Hepzibah Pynchon was about to do. 
It has already been observed that, in the basement story of the gable fronting on the street, an unworthy ancestor nearly a century ago had fitted up a shop. Ever since the old gentleman retired from trade and fell asleep under his coffin lid, not only the shop door, but the inner arrangements had been suffered to remain unchanged, while the dust of ages gathered inch deep over the shelves and counter and partly filled an old pair of scales as if it were of value enough to be weighed. It treasured itself up, too, in the half-open till, where there still lingered a base sixpence worth neither more nor less than the hereditary pride which had here been put to shame. Such had been the state and condition of the little shop in old Hepzibah's childhood when she and her brother used to play at hide-and-seek in its forsaken precincts. So it had remained until within a few days past. But now, though the shop window was still closely curtained from the public gaze, a remarkable change had taken place in its interior. The rich and heavy festoons of cobweb, which it had cost a long ancestral succession of spiders their life's labor to spin and weave, had been carefully brushed away from the ceiling. The counter, shelves, and floor had all been scoured, and the latter was overstrewn with fresh blue sand. The brown scales, too, had evidently undergone rigid discipline in an unavailing effort to scrub off the rust, which, alas, had eaten through and through their substance." Neither was the little old shop any longer empty of merchantable goods. A curious eye, privileged to take an account of stock and investigate behind the counter, would have discovered a barrel, yea, uh, two or three barrels and half ditto, one containing flour, another apples, and a third perhaps Indian meal. There was likewise a square box of pine wood, full of soap in bars, also another of the same size in which were tallow candles, ten to the pound, a small stock of brown sugar, some white beans and split peas, and a few other commodities of low price and such as are constantly in demand, made up the bulkier portion of the merchandise. It might have been taken for a ghostly or phantasmagoric reflection of the old shopkeeper pensions shabbily provided shelves, save that some of the articles were of a description and outward form which could hardly have been known in his day. For instance, there was a glass pickle jar filled with fragments of Gibraltar rock, not indeed splinters of the veritable stone foundation of the famous fortress, but bits of delectable candy neatly done up in white paper. Jim Crow, moreover, was seen executing his world-renowned dance in gingerbread. A party of leaden dragoons were galloping along one of the shelves in equipments and uniforms of modern cut, and there were some sugar figures with no strong resemblance to the humanity of any epoch, but less unsatisfactorily representing our own fashions than those of a hundred years ago. And another phenomenon, still more strikingly modern, was a package of lucifer matches which in old times would have been thought actually to borrow their instantaneous flame from the nether fires of Tophet. In short, to bring the matter at once to a point, it was incontrovertibly evident that somebody had taken the shop and fixtures of the long-retired and forgotten Mr. Pynchon and was about to renew the enterprise of that departed worthy with a different set of customers. Who could this bold adventurer be? And of all places in the world, why had he chosen the House of the Seven Gables as the scene of his commercial speculations? We returned to the elderly maiden. She at length withdrew her eyes from the dark countenance of the colonel's portrait, heaved a sigh, indeed, her breast was a very cave of airless that morning, and stepped across the room on tiptoe, as is the customary gait of elderly women. Passing through an intervening passage, she opened a door that communicated with the shop just now so elaborately described. Owing to the projection of the upper story, and still more to the thick shadow of the pinchin elm, which stood almost directly in front of the gable, the twilight here was still as much akin to night as morning. Another heavy sigh from Miss Pynchon. After a moment's pause on the threshold, peering towards the window with her near-sighted scowl as if frowning down some bitter enemy, she suddenly projected herself into the shop. The haste and, as it were, the galvanic impulse of the movement were really quite startling. Nervously, in a sort of frenzy, we might almost say, she began to busy herself in arranging some children's playthings and other little wares on the shelves and at the shop window. 
In the aspect of this dark arrayed, pale faced, ladylike old figure, there was a deeply tragic character that contrasted irreconcilably with the ludicrous pettiness of her employment. It seemed a queer anomaly that so gaunt and dismal a personage should take a toy in hand, a miracle that the toy did not vanish in her grasp, a miserably absurd idea that she should go on perplexing her stiff and somber intellect with the question how to tempt little boys into her premises. Yet, such is undoubtedly her object. Now she places a gingerbread elephant against the window, but with so tremulous a touch that it tumbles upon the floor with the dismemberment of three legs in its trunk. It has ceased to be an elephant and has become a few bits of musty gingerbread. There again, she has upset a tumbler of marbles, all of which roll different ways and each individual marble devil directed into the most difficult obscurity that it can find. Heaven help our poor old Hepzibah and forgive us for taking a ludicrous view of her position. As her rigid and rusty frame goes down upon its hands and knees in quest of the absconding marbles, we positively feel so much the more inclined to shed tears of sympathy from the very fact that we must needs turn aside and laugh at her. For here, and if we fail to impress it suitably upon the reader, it is our own fault, not that of the theme. Here is one of the truest points of melancholy interest that occur in ordinary life. It was the final throw of what called itself old gentility. A lady who had fed herself from childhood with the shadowy food of aristocratic reminiscences and whose religion it was that a lady's hand soils itself irremediably by doing aught for bread, this born lady, after sixty years of narrowing means, is fain to step down from her pedestal of imaginary rank. Poverty, treading closely at her heels for a lifetime, has come up with her at last. She must earn her own food or starve. And we have stolen upon Miss Hepzibah Pynchon too irreverently at the instant of time when the patrician lady is to be transformed into the plebeian woman. In this Republican country, amid the fluctuating waves of our social life, somebody is always at the drowning point. The tragedy is enacted with as continual a repetition as that of a popular drama on a holiday, and nevertheless is felt as deeply perhaps as when an hereditary noble sinks below his order. More deeply, since with us rank is the grosser substance of wealth and a splendid establishment and has no spiritual existence after the death of these, but dies hopelessly along with them. And therefore, since we have been unfortunate enough to introduce our heroine at so inauspicious a juncture, we would entreat for a mood of due solemnity in the spectators of her fate. Let us behold in poor Hepzibah the immemorial lady, two hundred years old, on this side of the water, and thrice as many on the other, with her antique portraits, pedigrees, coats of arms, records and traditions, and her claim as joint heiress to that princely territory at the eastward, no longer a wilderness, but a populous fertility, born, too, in Pynchon Street, under the Pynchon Elm, and in the Pynchon House, where she has spent all her days, reduced now, in that very house, to be the hucksteress of a scent shop. This business of setting up a petty shop is almost the only resource of women in circumstances at all similar to those of our unfortunate recluse. With her nearsightedness and those tremulous fingers of hers, at once inflexible and delicate, she could not be a seamstress, although her sampler of fifty years gone by exhibited some of the most recondite specimens of ornamental needlework. A school for little children had been often in her thoughts, and at one time she had begun a review of her early studies in the New England Primer with a view to prepare herself for the office of instructress. But the love of children had never been quickened in Hepzibah's heart and was now torpid, if not extinct. She watched the little people of the neighborhood from her chamber window and doubted whether she could tolerate a more intimate acquaintance with them. Besides, in our day, the very ABC has become a science, greatly too abstruse to be any longer taught by pointing a pin from letter to letter. A modern child could teach old Hepzibah more than old Hepzibah could teach the child. So, with many a cold, deep heartquake at the idea of at last coming into sordid contact with the world, from which she had so long kept aloof, while every added day of seclusion had rolled another stone against the cavern door of her hermitage, the poor thing bethought herself of the ancient shop window, 
the rusty scales and dusty till. She might have held back a little longer, but another circumstance not yet hinted at had somewhat hastened her decision. Her humble preparations, therefore, were duly made, and the enterprise was now to be commenced. Nor was she entitled to complain of any remarkable singularity in her fate. For in the town of her nativity, we might point to several little shops of a similar description, some of them in houses as ancient as that of the Seven Gables. And one or two it may be where a decayed gentlewoman stands behind the counter as grim an image of family pride as Miss Hepzibah Pynchon herself. It was overpoweringly ridiculous, we must honestly confess it, the deportment of the maiden lady while setting her shop in order for the public eye. She stole on tiptoe to the window as cautiously as if she conceived some bloody-minded villain to be watching behind the elm tree with intent to take her life. Stretching out her long, lank arm, she put a paper of pearl buttons, a Jew's harp, or whatever the small article might be in its destined place, and straightway vanished back into the dusk as if the world need never hope for another glimpse of her. It might have been fancied, indeed, that she expected to minister to the wants of the community unseen, like a disembodied divinity or enchantress holding forth her bargains to the reverential and awe-stricken purchaser in an invisible hand. But Hepzibah had no such flattering dream. She was well aware that she must ultimately come forward and stand revealed in her proper individuality, but, like other sensitive persons, she could not bear to be observed in the gradual process and chose rather to flash forth on the world's astonished gaze at once. The inevitable moment was not much longer to be delayed. The sunshine might now be seen stealing down the front of the opposite house from the windows of which came a reflected gleam, struggling through the boughs of the elm tree and enlightening the interior of the shop more distinctly than heretofore. The town appeared to be waking up. A baker's cart had already rattled through the street, chasing away the latest vestige of night's sanctity with the jingle-jangle of its dissonant bells. A milkman was distributing the contents of his cans from door to door, and the harsh peal of a fisherman's conch shell was heard far off around the corner. None of these tokens escaped Hepzibah's notice. The moment had arrived. To delay longer would be only to lengthen out her misery. Nothing remained except to take down the bar from the shop door, leaving the entrance free more than free, welcome, as if all were household friends to every passerby whose eyes might be attracted by the commodities at the window. This last act Hepzibah now performed, letting the bar fall with what smote upon her excited nerves as a most astounding clatter. Then, as if the only barrier betwixt herself and the world had been thrown down and a flood of evil consequences would come tumbling through the gap, she fled into the inner parlor, threw herself into the ancestral elbow chair, and wept. Our miserable old Hepzibah. It is a heavy annoyance to a writer who endeavors to represent nature, its various attitudes and circumstances, in a reasonably correct outline and true coloring that so much of the mean and ludicrous should be hopelessly mixed up with the purest pathos which life anywhere supplies to him. What tragic dignity, for example, can be wrought into a scene like this? How can we elevate our history of retribution for the sin of long ago when, as one of our most prominent figures, we are compelled to introduce not a young and lovely woman, nor even the stately remains of beauty, storm shattered by affliction, but a gaunt, sallow, rusty-jointed maiden in a long-waisted silk gown and with the strange horror of a turban on her head? Her visage is not even ugly. It is redeemed from insignificance only by the contraction of her eyebrows into a near-sighted scowl. And finally, her great life trial seems to be that, after sixty years of idleness, she finds it convenient to earn comfortable bread by setting up a shop in a small way. Nevertheless, if we look through all the heroic fortunes of mankind— we shall find this same entanglement of something mean and trivial with whatever is noblest in joy or sorrow. Life is made up of marble and mud, and without all the deeper trust in a comprehensive sympathy above us, we might hence be led to suspect the insult of a sneer, as well as an immitigable frown on the iron countenance of fate. 
What is called poetic insight is the gift of discerning in this sphere of strangely mingled elements the beauty and the majesty which are compelled to assume a garb so sordid. The end of chapter two. Read by Rick Kistner for Lit.